welcome to The Stump, a podcast about forestry, careers, and really just about anything that's on my mind that I want to uh, put out there. And uh, today we have a special guest uh, coming to talk to us about some of my favorite topics, carbon climate and the forests, um, Dr. Elaine O'Neill, and uh, I'll let her kind of... Uh, Tell a little bit more about herself and uh, and and what she does and how she got involved with uh, carbon climate and our forests. And she is the executive director of the Washington Farm Forestry. So uh, with that, welcome, Elaine. Thanks, Matt. And thanks for offering to record this talk. Uh, it's something that I first gave in Bellingham, Washington on November 30th. And that was under the aegis of the Watkin chapter of the Washington Farm Forestry Association. They wanted me to come up there and talk to their folks and also talk to anybody else who wanted to hear. Um, it was pretty cool. I think we had about 71 people there from all over, all, all walks of interest on this topic. So it is a very, it's something people are very, very interested in. So to, to start this process, and I think to help set the stage for people. I think it's probably useful to share a story about how I came to be on this remarkable journey. And it's quite a journey. Um, I would say, oops, it's not advancing. Uh oh, there we go. Hey, there, there, we we go. go. there we go. I would say I could never have imagined the trajectory of this professional life experience. So I started out as a dirt farmer uh, and a cowgirl in, in Alberta. And I ended up as a scientist in Washington state who's really had the good fortune to gain national stature for the work that I'm about to share with you, the carbon work. Uh, here I am with Bruce Westerman, the only forester in Congress and with Deb Haaland, the first Native American woman in Congress. Um, this was shortly after, uh, I think this was shortly after I'd provided testimony in the committee with, that Deb was chairing. It was her very first uh, committee that she chaired that day. And there's also some early work that I had done with the Climate Impacts Group. But before that, I started out as a field forester in British Columbia. I was planning in civil culture and harvesting activities uh, in the far north. So far north, in fact, that I was at the northern extent of the natural range of Douglas fir. Uh, and I also figured out how to use a chainsaw when I was up there. But that's just <laughs> to set the stage. Um, the thing about the Douglas fir that's worthwhile for people to understand is it really existed. It was as far north as, as Douglas fir existed, but there was a, a big wide space there where there was no Douglas fir. So something else had happened in the past. It, and it really existed at, as pockets of this amazing 400 year old trees, big trees amidst a vast sea of fire origin, old growth lodgepole pine that as you can see in the pictures was doomed to die. It wasn't doomed to die by the saw, but by the a bug the size of a grain of rice, there it is blown up about 10,000 times, um, that gained the upper hand in the battle for life. And that mountain pine beetle outbreak was really due to a few short years of warmer winters that advantaged the bugs to the detriment of the trees. So that really was my introduction to the impacts of climate change. Early on, this was identified by entomologists. I was working in a district uh, for uh, the equivalent of the Department of Natural Resources uh, Ministry of Forest District in the far north. And the uh, entomologists would come up and they would look at all of this and wonder what we were going to do about it. The operationalists said, oh, this is just natural. Um, we got to a point where you couldn't deny it. I mean, everywhere you looked, you had this massive mortality event. I would say it was an outcome that was both perfectly natural because the, these are both a natural insect and a, a natural host and perfectly unnatural at the same time. It was pretty devastating to, to the forests, as you can see in those images, to the communities, to the economies and to the people. So uh, I remember Elaine, I wanted to had a quick question. All the red trees, those are the the dead lodgepole pine, right? Right. And so, and then the green ones are kind of the other species, Douglas fir, whatever else is native to that area. 
Uh, in some instances, that's true. In other instances, they just hadn't been hit the prior year. They're probably already dead. They'd been hit. Because if you see down at the bottom, there's some gray trees. So that was the two years ago. The red were last year, and the green might be this year if they're pine. Okay. Um, I think it's it's important, you know, so I was a field forester. I was operational. I was out there looking at things. And I remember arguing with the scientists at the time that their models were not fitting what I was seeing in the woods, not even close. So that wasn't the entomologist. That was the people modeling about where, how these things should have developed over time. One thing that did do was it sparked a fire in me to understand more about the systems that we're managing. And I ended up, um, there's a couple of other things. I also realized that the level of care a forest might need to weather the upcoming storm, you know, this climate change storm was best provided at small scales. Hence my interest in working with small forest landowners to address the challenges facing them. There aren't very many small forest landowners in BC. It's mostly owned by the state, well, the province. So I ended up at UW in 2001, looking at the regulatory impacts on small forest landowners and pretty quickly saw that we were headed for a train wreck here at the cross section of regulation, the idea that no, just leave it alone, don't touch it, that's the best thing you can do, and forest health. And that led to my PhD focus on climate and mountain pine beetle outbreaks here in Washington. It, it was became especially apparent during my PhD work that leaving forests to fend for themselves, given the dynamic changes that we're facing this climate wise, was going to generate some pretty perverse outcomes. So if you look at those two charts, the one on the right is the British Columbia trends with that giant hockey stick starting in about 99. And the one on the last left is Eastern Washington trends starting at around about 2000, 2001, where they both took off. Now the scales are quite different. Uh, BC, that's thousands of hectares and in, in its acres in, in thousands. No, it was millions of hectares and then it was thousands of acres. Uh, the end of the run in BC it was something like 35 million acres when you did the conversion that had been affected by bark beetle. Pretty hot, horrifying. So I remember at one point I was, I was working with the Climate Im Impacts Group at UW you know, based on this work that I just des described. And um, we had to give a presentation in, in Seattle, at the Washington Climate Change Impact Assessment Conference in Seattle in 2009. And the keynote was then Congressman Jay Inslee, and he called reading our report ak akin to reading about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I was like, oh, brother. Um, Given the focus of my work, obviously, I was responsible re for reporting on either the green horse of, of death or the white horse of pestilence, I'm not sure which, um, because of the work that I was doing with the bark beetle. And then, you know, I had to think about it as well, you know, I guess all that horse riding was somewhat useful. So all joking aside, it was pretty clear that all of our ingenuity and talent was going to be needed to address the challenges ahead. But how are we going to do that? Uh, it was about then there was, you know, so that was two, 2006, 2004, five and six. And the, all the rage was talking about changing out your light bulbs. Uh, by 2016, I'm going to say the fear mongering reported in this NASA blog that I put up was pretty much everywhere. And it had been in full swing for at least a couple of decades. You know, this idea, are we all going to die? How soon will humans go extinct? And these are the kinds of questions that scientists were fa facing. But you had to keep in mind that the problems in our systems had been, you know, ongoing since the late 80s. I, I had seen some of that in my early work in northern BC. So the question became, are we going to look at climate change as a driver for conversation of sustainability, or are we gonna use it as a mechanism to generate fear? Um, do we double down on the effort to in engage in innovative solutions? And so we in the forestry fields were faced with this challenge. What do we do in our field 
to make a difference to this gigantic worldwide system. I mean, climate change is a great leveler because what you do here, you can push down and you can reduce here, but it's going to pop up somewhere else unless you really think about it as a global system. It, it, it makes that idea of think, um, think global, act lo local, really up close and personal. So our question was, what could we do that did not just push the problem elsewhere? You know, something we often do when we offload the production of our consumer goods and materials to a poorer country with fewer environmental regulations. You know, that's something I've started to think about as environmental imperialism. Enter the carbon story. At the same time, I was really, really fortunate to be working with another team at UW called Quorum, who at the time, had, they'd already spent a decade looking at the environmental performance of wood. They looked at it through the lens of operational research, which is by design directed at using science to solve real world, world problems. And I, I remember when I laid this on the desk of my then boss, Bruce Lipkin, and he was like, well, this is interesting. He took it away and studied it for a good long while. It, it became a focus for how we looked at our analysis and how did we approach this analysis uh, of what we could do in the forest sector around carbon, climate, and forest. Quorum, the Consortium for Research on Renewable Industrial Materials, is a consortium. It was and it is. It remains to this day. It has about... 20 research institutions scattered across the country. Each one of these uh, has a different expertise related to wood, forests, operations, affiliated fields. We're everywhere. By then, Quorum had already published a series of really data intensive studies and analyses that demonstrated that number one, wood took far less energy to produce than comparable material substitutes like steel and concrete and that wood stored car carbon, but the other products didn't. And this is just an example where you look at um, the net benefit. If, if zero is the, the line that you know splits the left and the right, anything to the right of that stores more carbon than it takes to produce it. Anything to the left emits more carbon um, than it stores. So obviously steel doesn't store any carbon, so it's just the emission is what it's tracking there. So this um, became not too much of a leap of, I'm going to say not too much of a leap of analytic capability to realize that if climate change was driven by increasing carbon dioxide, then wood had to be part of the solution, not just standing for us, but also wood in production systems. Because it is, at its most basic chemical level, wood's a carbohydrate. It's created using the life force of the tree, some water, some sunlight, and it emits clean water and oxygen. I mean, think about it. You couldn't get a better CO2 sucking machine if you tried. It's just the perfect machine. Yeah, and I mean, so so basic of a concept, too. Um, but I will say that those formulas are one of the regions reasons why I became a forest engineer and not a aeronautical engineer. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you just think about, you know, he clear back into elementary school, kind of learned the pretty, pretty much the basics that uh, plants take in CO2 and use sunshine and they give us a lot of oxygen. And that means if you're going to have a balanced equation, that carbon has got to go someplace, which it ends up uh, oftentimes in in our case, uh, as a foresters in the wood. It ends up in that biologic material, that's for certain. In the, in the wood, well, it ends up in the standing tree in the wood. I mean, one of the things I, I didn't get into last week because that was a, you know, it was a layperson audience, but when you think about wood relative to other materials, it's pretty amazing because your, your wood itself is about 400 to one carbon to nitrogen. Some species, it's like 1200 to one. Now, the leaves are only about 50 to one. And the soil, by the time you make it into the organic layer is like 35 to one. So where does all the carbon go that's in the soil? 
you know, for, for this material to decay and go into the soil, you have to release a lot of carbon. And so it becomes this cycle. It's a cycle of life. And to think about hand, managing that cycle with one-way flows, is it's, it's pretty hair-raising just doing the chemistry or the accounting for it, which I think is where a lot of the confusion is. Shall we go on? Yeah, let's uh, let's keep going. All right. So I'll tell you, uh, the epiphany for me was the the need to include wood products in the sol solution space really came home to me. I started interacting with architects and engineers. They were also trying to solve this climate problem. But then they told me, I was at some talk, I can't remember when, that they had, that they, worldwide, they were building the equivalent of a New York City every 35 days. And they were worrying about where they're going to get the materials. And I'm worrying about the land because I just went into a map and found out that, um, you know, New York covers 302.6 square miles. If you do that every 35 days, that's a lot of land. That is a, a lot ton of, of land. What's that? That is a ton of land. It's a ton of land. And I'll, I'll tell you, that was the one place where I um, I almost succumbed to fear that day, thinking, how are we going to do this? What can we do? What can we do? And I say lucky for the world, we have some amazing minds in the architecture and the engineering fields, amazing minds. And we were fortunate that so we have some of the best right here in Seattle and more broadly on the West Coast. We really have some amazing minds in this field trying to solve this problem. Now, their solution includes wood, a lot of it. And if you look at these pictures, it's used in really artful and beautiful ways that are also utilitarian, carbon friendly. I mean, on the bottom left is the Bullet Foundation building. It's iconic. It's in Seattle. Um, it's the first building to meet the International Living Building Challenge, I think, in North America. It's an amazing building. Um, so these folks are working incredibly hard to create sustainable, beautiful buildings for people to work, live, and play in. And then here's our latest addition. I'm calling it a Seattle gym, but they call it Heartwood. Susan Jones of Atelier Jones just built this mass timber eight story building uh, there. I think it's on Capitol Hill. It includes middle income housing. So this isn't a rendition. This is actually what it looks like inside. Wow. Um, yeah, beautiful. And Susan is also a small forest landowner. So she has worked really hard to bring this into the mainstream, including spending two or three years in codes and standards to get this. So it, it's been accepted in that process. She reported on sometime here in November. Now, that's a, this is one of the solutions and they have big dreams. Um, this is from the North American Mass Timber Report 2020 State of the Industry. And this was their goal that by 2034, they would have 24,000 mass timber buildings constructed per year because this uses a lot of carbon or a lot of wood. So it stores an enormous amount of carbon. And then on the right is the carbon impact in millions of tons per year. So they're thinking by 2034, if they're able to achieve this goal, the building stock would be carbon negative. In other words, they'd be storing more carbon than they're emitting to build, build buildings. And that's kind of a big deal because the emissions, the national emissions for buildings is it's a really hard, high number. Don't quote me, 30%, 40% maybe. A lot of our emissions go into building buildings. And so this is a really um, powerful goal to reduce emissions and solve the, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, challenge. Question is, where's that wood going to come from? Good question. Um, right now, the Pacific Northwest produces about 31 to 34 percent of the U.S. lumber and plywood. I think the 34 percent of the lumber and 34 percent of the plywood, or maybe the other way around. 
but most of it comes from two to three percent of the U.S. land base because most of it is actually coming from the PNW private forest lands, a little bit from the public lands in the Pacific Northwest, which includes Washington and Oregon. When you put that in a national context and a global context, the U.S. supplies about 19 percent of worldwide round wood that's used for infrastructure. So this is logs, not necessarily for heating. So the Pacific Northwest really supplies about 7% of worldwide wood from really 2 to 3% of the U.S. land base. Sounds like a lot. Um, but here's something that I always find really remarkable. This is forest inventory and analysis data. So the U.S. Forest Service, every decade they have to, uh, they measure every year, but every decade they report out what's the standing inventory. And we really haven't reduced our standing inventory per acre over the 70 years we've been tracking it. So 1952 to 2017 was the report out periods. And our rotations are shorter than that. So it's like, okay, we're, we're managing to grow an enormous amount of timber right now, even though we're harvesting, you know, 7% of what's supplied to the world. And that's really because this is an amazing place to grow trees. It's almost perfect, in fact. And because we have this, uh, we've become remarkably proficient at adapting forest management to our ecological conditions. And I just want to brag a little bit about um, the establishment of the first tree farm in the U.S. in 1941, which is right here in Washington. And that was the smart start of the American tree farm system. And, you know, I have a lot of small forest landowners that are members of that system have been for 50 or 60 years, which is amazing. Now, there's no doubt that uh, there are other regions that grow trees faster than we do. The U.S. South, South America, New Zealand, but their wood quality isn't as good. And it's a long way from there to here if we want to build a house or a deck or a tree house or even a garden bed. So will we be part of that solution? Are we going to be part of the solution proposed by the architecture community? Hopefully, Cur we should be. Well, currently, the answer is no. And my reasoning for that is that we don't have the social license that supports the kind of investment in good force management that's needed to support this burgeoning demand. So I want you to think about this for a bit. We have over 50% of our forest land reserved from harvest. So that's the restricted forest on this uh, little pie, pie chart. We have about 22 million acres. That means about 12 mi million of it is reserved from harvest for other purposes. A lot of it is in the national forest, but not all. all. And then every year, there are more and more demands to sit set aside more and more of this land for other uses until we are way past the point of where benefits exceed costs. Now, remember, uh, the, there's this goal of 30, 30 by 30, 30% 30 of the land preserved by 2030. We're already at 53%. And then the other thing that sort of surprised me when I ran these numbers, again, this is forced inventory data, is we have a preponderance of old force in all of our force types. I thought it was just spe specific to some of the high elevation forests that are have a greater tendency to be reserved, but it's actually all forests. We have a preponderance of old growth, um, except for our hardwoods, not so much because they tend to die out by the time they're the 60 and redwoods have just been planted and non-stocked obviously don't have any trees. So we got 53% of our forests are also over 60 and 38% are over 80 or technically classified as old growth in this state, which is kind of a stunning number. And unfortunately, those old forests are dying on us. Uh, this is again, FIA data. We took data from that for the Western states and published it, uh, this Lipke et al. paper, the Plant a Trillion Trees campaign, where we realized that even though we had really reduced harvest on federal lands in the 90s, early 90s, we didn't really see that increase in, uh, we saw a little bit of increase in net growth, 
but then mortality really started uh, ramping up in about 2006. And we're, we're now, you know, most places were still growing a little bit more than we're losing, but there are a number of regions in the uh, inland west where states were actually they're losing more carbon than they're sequestering every year. We're a little bit better off here in Washington. Uh, here's some work that was done by uh, University of Washington published just last year in a WSU extension report where they took that same data and they compared two periods and they were measuring the growth increment and then where did it all go to? And they aggregated it by industry, DNR, forest service and small forest landowners. The forest service, um, their sequestration is still reasonably okay, but 70% of what they sequester immediately gets em emitted because of fire, insects and disease. So, you put more land into that category and you end up with more of the same thing. Uh, industry by far does the, the best job of having that, uh, those forests suck carbon out of the air and then putting it somewhere else, most of it in harvested wood products. Um, DNR does a pretty good job of that. And the small landowners actually do pretty much the worst job of that, except for my small forest landowners. And we're going to talk about that later, but there's, you know, there's a lot of low hanging fruit here for some improvements for small forest landowners and for some acknowledgement of how this system works. So where's the wood gonna come from if not here? Remember we produce 7% of the wood, world's wood now. Where's the wood gonna come from if not here? Uh, the Softwood Lumber Board actually predicts a good chunk of it is going to come from the U.S. Southeast. Think Alabama and Georgia and North Carolina, those sorts of areas. Uh, this chart is the same data that looks at the number of acres in the south, which is the dotted red line, and the volume increment since 1950s to the latest survey period. I mean, it's almost doubled. And they harvest most of the rest of the saw logs that feed mills in the in North America. It's an amazingly productive area and they have a lot of support for doing that. So th that's one of the places it's gonna come from. The other place that they think is gonna come from is an area called the Southern Cone, which is really the countries in Chile and Argentina, Uruguay, a little tiny bit of Brazil, but not most of the main Amazon area. It's basically the stuff on the on the the narrow little part of South America. So where does that leave us here in Washington? Well, unfortunately, I think it's going to leave us with more sick, dead, and dying forests, like the, some of the pictures that we're seeing here, both eastern and western. The stuff on the on the right hand side is some of the examples of things that we can expect to see in Western Washington with more extreme events and, and lack of management. And this stuff um, on the left hand side is more Eastern Washington, although we are getting fires in Western Washington. And some of our worst fires ever, uh, biggest fires were in Western Washington. Think Yakult Burn in 1910. For certain, we're probably likely to get a few remnant old growth stands. Um, some of them are going to be remarkable, like the one on the the one on the left is actually a picture of H.J. Andrews down in Oregon. That's before it burned. Um, but most are going to be ordinary. And the reason I say that is because I've looked at enough inventory data, but also because of my e early years working in old growth in northern B.C., there are always a few what I call Tiger Wood stands because I live here now, but we called them Wayne Gretzky stands there. Um, with the rest of them being sort of ordinary, it's like us, well, it's like us going out and playing pickup golf or ho pick up hockey games or something. We we could be old, but we're not very stunning. Yet. Um, I think we also can expect at least as much conversion of conversion of forest land to non forest uses as we've experienced in the recent past. Um, 
small forest landowners tend to convert more on average than other kinds of landowners, but there's some transitional stories in there. So this is looking historically at the forest land conversion. It was 4% loss from 2007 to 2019. And then that same study, um, they came up with this heat map of expected conversion going forward. And you could see where most of the development pressure is. This, by the way, was before COVID. And what we know is uh, during COVID, there was just this explosion of people moving out of the cities and into all these areas. So I would suspect if they did that heat map now, they they uh, see slightly different uh, colors in different places, which is kind of interesting. So, about then, everybody was a little down, my sad story. Um, but I do think that there's an alternate reality. And I want to talk a little bit about that. And because I think, you know, I, I work with a small forest landowner community. And if they're, if they're anything, they're naturally optimistic. And they kind of have to be. It's kind of like, uh, you know, I think all foresters, you, if you're, doing something that takes 40 or 50 or 60 years to come to fruition, you have to have some sort of optimism that it's going to get there. Um, and so we don't really aspire to sad realities. We aspire to some more joyful ones. Um, and so I think that there are alternate realities that look better if we do get the social license. If it builds within our communities, we can do a lot of things. There's a lot of low, low hanging fruit here. And so what I wanted to do for this bit was just go through some ideas to leave people with a taste of what it is to keep that keeps our community hopeful and also willing to do the work um, and be a part of the solution. And I would hope that it would leave others th to think uh, to think about Washington as part of this global system of, yes, global system of weather, global system of climate and of commerce, even though, and recognize that we have a uniquely local contribution to make given our history, our innovation, our sustainability, ethic, our human ingenuity in this part of the world. So here's our, my alternate reality with a small forest land order flavor. I have to say there's something to be said for longevity. We celebrated 70 years as an organization this year. That means 70 years of learning how to be a part of nature instead of constantly hearing we are apart from it and it needs to be left to its own devices. That's inherent in the way that we look at our lands. That means we get to and often do celebrate, oops, excuse me, um, celebrate being a critical part of our rural landscape and that means we get to work. We work really hard to be worthy of our tagline, which is stewards of the land for generations to come. We're very big on celebrating family, community, mentorship, on celebrating the yearly return of salmon to our river. We saw this amazing 60,000 strong run of pinks this year on the Olympic Peninsula, but they were really everywhere. It was an amazing run of salmon this year. We were out there just ogling. We were so grateful and thankful. Um, we celebrate mentorship. We celebrate learning from not just our peers, but also experts and other forest resource managers. Here we were up in Winthrop looking at fire. We celebrate the creatures in our forest. I, I think, I don't know how many game cameras we have out there. And it's like, oh, look, I have a bear today. I have whatever I have today. Um, we are grateful for the opportunity to teach our youth about work and about beauty. And even to appreciate the many cycles, you know, the appreciate the cycle of regeneration, of hard work, of growth, of harvest and renewal. It's it's basically two weeks out of 50 years that you get to harvest, but people don't really recognize all of the other elements of it, including what I like to call the diaper phase when you're putting those protectors on the on the trees so the, the deer and the elk don't eat them. And this is a beautiful one. We believe in sustaining special places. Almost every small forest landowner farm I've been on, maybe everyone, 
has some area that a forebear decided was never going to get cut. So it's grandfather's park or it's grandma and grandpa white pine. Every place has, every family has their special place that is a contribution to the uniqueness of their farm. Um, we like trying a lot of stuff. There's a lot of innovation in this community. This is a 33 year old redwood stand and the guy's so pleased with it. And he says, um, planted in 1989 or 90, he says, we store car uh, carbon the way a fat man stores carbs which I think is totally hilarious. That's an amazing stand. Um, we've also learned from the first peoples about the importance of and how to use fire to sustain our ecosystems. Um, this is uh, Bob's favorite way of doing jackpot burns to reduce fire risk and generate ceanothus for the deer. And then he, he went along and, and taught the youth how to do the same thing. Of course, we'd be lying if we didn't acknowledge that we appreciate Harvest Day, comes every 40 to 80 years, but we also plan for regeneration. And then after that, work diligently to protect those seedlings so that they grow above the deer. And we also are working at um, not just harvesting the big trees, but also harvesting the little stuff so that we can reforest a healthy, vibrant forest into the future. Uh, we're very excited about science and data and using data to drive decisions. And most importantly, we look forward to the idea of ensuring the longevity of our legacies and their succession to the next generation. Um, that gentleman was actually my host in Bellingham. That sign was taken a while ago because I think he said he's on 61 years now. And the farm was first purchased somewhere in the 1880s. That's longevity. And so when I look at the ownership map of Washington, and I think of everything that I've talked about today, I think our choices as a, as a state are, are kind of stark. We can either continue to erode the social license to practice forestry, which will lead to its demise, or we can think about the remarkable renaissance of possibilities that we have that our community and our partners can provide to make this place not just evergreen, but a profound contribution to this challenge that we have with carbon climate change and our forests. So that's what I had for you today. Um, I can stop talking and we can have a dialogue. I'd be delighted to chat with you about this. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, that was that was a great presentation and, you know, brings up lots of interesting questions, I guess, for me. Um, I appreciate in one of your earlier slides the comment about fear mongering. Um, it it seems like we're in a. I, I don't know how to describe it, a weird place right now in kind of the social political landscape here in Washington where a lot of people talk about wanting to do all sorts of cool things with wood you know whether it's cross laminated timber or you know other types of mass timber products and building higher and bigger with wood um, and then you know all sorts of you know unique new cons you know pro products coming from wood Yet it also seems like there's this very strong narrative about not wanting to cut trees. And, and I guess when I look at the science and the data and, you know, and maybe it's just because I'm a forester, um, though I was born and raised in the heart of Seattle, um, how I became a forester, who knows, but it, I, I guess, how, how do you see us sharing this message in a way that, I mean, really all landowners play a key part in this, whether they're, you know, the small forest landowner, part of farm forestry, you know, and they've got their 20 acres clear up, you know, to the large industrials that own millions of acres in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I guess it's, how, do you have any ideas around the social license piece 
because my my personal opinion is I feel like we have a very loud but very small uh, group of folks who really just don't like change. Um, and then they get really upset when the science doesn't follow their narrative. And it's really not about climate. It's more about just not cutting trees. Um, that was kind of a long winded question, but I guess I, I'm trying to figure out how you lay out a very, uh, compelling storyline. I've seen a lot of the data. It all makes sense to me. How, how do we get others to understand it, I guess? Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a story, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a data, I'm a data nerd because I'm a scientist. I love this stuff. But I can talk to my friends and their eyes roll back into the back of their head because it's like, it's just data. It doesn't mean anything to them. But when you talk about the story, then it means something. And I think that we have not done a great job of telling a story. We've done a great job of here's some data, do with it what you will. But we haven't done a great job of telling a story. I mean, look at the picture behind me. That's from one of my tree farmers. It's um, been obviously harvested, reforested. It's in that beautiful stage where you have all the foxglove and everything else there. It's a haven for bees and birds and all sorts of wildlife that need it for forage. But we don't talk about that as part of uh, the nature of the cycle of renewability. We keep arguing about, oh, we need to cut trees. Well, cutting trees is two years out of, or two weeks out of 50 years. What about the rest of it? So are we doing a good job telling the story of why we even do this? I mean, when I go and visit with my various um, landowners, every one of them has a unique and beautiful and remarkable story. And they all do things a little bit differently. You know, our state tree farmer of the year, let's talk about them for a second. I just want to brag on them for a second. I think they've been certified for I don't know, 65 or 68 years or something like that with the American tree farm system. But that's, that's just a drop in the bucket for them. They have a 90 year plan. They plan, they have a 90 year schedule of what they're going to do. How many they're, you know, log four or five acres every five to 10 years or whatever it is. And they don't have a huge spot place they don't have a small place but their their point is that they want to grow 90 year old timber because they want a preponderance of telephone pole, poles high value material and they also use it as a way to build family build family connections it's beautiful yeah i mean i i think I, mean, I guess that's been kind of my frustration, you know, being in this industry is we do tend to talk from the, the, the data side, which can be very boring. And it feels like a lot of those folks who either just don't understand our industry or don't like the fact that what our, our industry does, whether that's the small forest landowner, like you said, is, got a 90 year plan. And if you think about it, they've been certified for 50. That means they probably really have a 140 year plan. Um, you know, and, and I know some of your members and all the ones that I know are some of the hardest working, most dedicated people, uh, to, you know, tending, tending their land and, uh, making sure that it's viable for not only their generation, but, you know, their, the, the grandchildren of their grandchildren of their grandchildren um, in most cases. But, you know, it, it feels like oftentimes we're up against a, a storyline that tugs at your heartstrings of, you know, Oh, these, these poor big trees are being cut down, but you're right. We don't do a very good job of telling the entire narrative um, or, or even just talking about forest management from, the personal, more em emotional side, you know, the fact that foresters, regardless of whether they're working for 
you know, some of the, the biggest uh, timber companies in the world to, you know, the, the tree farmer of the year, or even the, the runner up to the runner up of the tree farmer of the year, you know, their, their heart is in it. And I think, you know, the one line I've heard from various people is, you know, foresters plant trees for generations they'll likely never know. Um, I think that to me is more of the story we need to be telling because as you laid out, it's beautiful product and the data shows that it's part of the solution. Have you, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to go to, to one of these uh, mass timber conferences or something like that. Um, if you have, just pop into some of the more technical um, classes that they offer. So you'll have a bunch of engineers and, and they're talking about moment stresses and how they connect these parts together and all this stuff. And my eyes are rolling into the back of my head and I don't know what they're talking about, but they're getting off on it because yeah. that's the mechanics of that. So if we're talking about that stuff, we should talk about that stuff amongst ourselves. But we don't, we shouldn't be talking even to our neighbors about that stuff because that's not the compelling piece of the narrative. You don't have Susan Jones or the people that put together the Billet Foundation talking about how they hook those pieces together. That's not the story. The story is look at how this beautiful, how beautiful this building is and how much carbon it's stored. They're not going to talk about the nuts and bolts of it. Right. Yeah. No, you're, you're, you're spot on. I mean, I've heard Susan's story and some of her presentations, you know, in the past of talking about how, you know, basically she became a small forest landowner and really suddenly started having to, to learn and dig into, uh, you know, what, what goes into creating all those, uh, wood products that she likes to use in her, uh, building projects. Um, you know, and you're right. And, and not all the, not all the background data and you know i'm i'm an engineer so i'm kind of a nerd guy anyway but it it's trying to drag out and tell that more personal story well why did you get into forestry you came out of seattle something must have happened um i i had an affinity for rural communities I was at the University of Washington during the height of the Spotted Owl Wars. And I don't know, just something connected me to forestry. I'd always enjoyed getting out in the woods. And I don't know, there just was, there was, there was something, something that was appealing to being able to get out and enjoy nature while at the same time, being part of a system that provides products that we as a society use every day and hanging out with some of the best people in the world, really. Um, you know, it's some of the people I've met are your members and I've met them through, uh, my job, um, you know, working as an engineer and I continue to interact with a lot of them. And like I said, you know, they're just, I don't know there, there was something that just drew me to it. Um, plus I didn't like hardcore chemistry, um, which is what I needed to go into aeronautical engineering. So, you know, crazy me, but, um, so yeah, well, this has been really fascinating, interesting. Um, I, sorry that I missed the original version, um, live back when you did this up in Bellingham, I was, uh, for my day job over in Wenatchee, learning about wood campuses and what it takes to try to uh, recruit new infrastructure, um, because that's the other uh, piece of the story is, you know, without sawmills and loggers and all that, um, it's kind of hard to get this stuff to market. So I, I'm glad that we could get together for this. So so let's just stop on that for a moment, because I never really emphasized that piece. I was emphasizing um, this small forest landowner piece, which is important for me from personally, because I one of the things that struck me when I was in northern BC, I mean, we had a massive uh, region 
to look after. And there was, when I started, there was like 39 people looking at 3 million hectares. So it was a seven and a half million acres. Massive. And every time there was a, a, a cut in federal funds or, or provincial funds, so state funds and federal funds here, well, then they would lay off people. You never, you never had enough people to do the kind of hands-on care that was needed. I mean, we never could have done the kinds of innovation that I've seen down here on small forest landowners. We just didn't have wasn't enough money, people, or time. And so when I look at what private landowners can do, small private, even large private, they can do a lot of things that are innovative. And it's, there's a lot more flexibility in the system. Of course, you know, there's also some demands for, I think the the large landowners have the, the shareholder demand, which is a big driver, but they also have a lot of really dedicated people. But all of those things are predicated on being able to sell a product. If you can't sell the product, I think what people don't really understand is when the profitability goes away, usually so does the forest land. At least that's what we've seen in almost every other region in the world. So I wouldn't expect it to be substantially different here. Yeah, no, I mean, I think to me, that's the, that is the, the key point is in most every place around the world, you know, land just naturally transitions to, you know, for lack of a better term, it's higher and better use or, or what um, gives the, whichever landowner, you know, their, the best return. And if you're in the business of growing trees and managing land for all the good things that come along with growing trees, if you don't have a place to sell your, sell your trees when it's time to harvest, you're going to then tend to be looking for some other use of that land going forward. And, uh, you know, that oftentimes, unfortunately, turns into uh, conversion to non-forest uses. So it, it seems like uh, that, that's one challenge and struggle that I see is getting that story out there that, you know, this is a system and we have to look at it as a system. Um I think you, you mentioned early on in your presentation there, if you, you push on one side, it's coming out the other side. So um, we have to kind of look at how we keep that whole system functioning. Because if you take one piece out of it, the whole thing may come to a grinding halt. Well, but that, that particular example was this idea that if we, you know, we're grappling it within the carbon, we have a, a small forest land or carbon work group that was, implemented um implemented it's we started last year it was passed as a part of the climate commitment act in 2021 and one of our challenges is to figure out how to make uh, carbon credits sort of a, a viable income stream or a viable market for small landowners and one of the real big challenges with that is that for those things to work they're supposed to be additional to something you're already doing. Uh, there, and you have to address something called leakage. Well, think about it. If we provide seven percent of the world's uh, saw timber, seven percent of the world's saw timber on two percent of the U.S. land base, and let's say we move it down to I don't know one point nine percent or something, then we have this timber that has to come from somewhere it doesn't the demand doesn't go away and if the benefit of these buildings with wood is um you know we think it's justifiable looking at the data there are models out there that are arguing that our our data is all wrong and their model is correct but let's just leave that aside for now because early on i figured out that Models are only as good as the data that go into them because I was a field forester and they were saying, well, this is where you're going to find your Douglas fir. And I'm like, did you tell the trees that? Because that's not where they are. You know, they're over here. Um, so they are, my point is that the science is continually evolving. But when you look at the massive data sets that we have used 
it's it's pretty clear that part of the solution is going to include more wood in the built environment. That's part of the solution. The question is, where does it come from? Does it come from a place like Washington that grows trees, you know, an amazing amount of trees um, that are, you know, durable? Or does it come from some other area that maybe doesn't have as, as many environmental regulations? Maybe it doesn't have as good an infrastructure. Maybe it doesn't have as much high tech, um, you know, just in terms of logging systems and the improvements in the last couple of decades. That's pretty amazing in itself. You know, I'd keep in mind, I came from a, an environment where our average volume, now I'm going to throw some numbers at you, and they're going to be in cubic meters, and I'm not even apologizing. So um, the average volume in that whole region was 327 cubic meters per hectare. That's what they harvested, 327 per hectare. The average age of what they were harvesting was probably 125. You know what we can produce here in 50 years? About yeah. five, 575 cubic meters per hectare per year. Wow. And if you really go gangbusters, I mean, this stand I'm looking at here, you'd probably do that in 30 years. So the point being that when we start to think about this waterbed effect we okay we're going to stop doing things here it's going to have to happen somewhere else but if it has to happen somewhere else and it takes four times amount the amount of area to do it in the same amount of time because maybe it only takes twice the area but it takes twice as long so that's four times the amount of area produce the same amount of wood well pretty soon you run out of land we only have one earth and we really have to think about that's what's the difficult thing of developing any kind of policy around this or even people wrapping their heads around this, because it's easy to act local and it's easy to think local. It's very hard for people to think about the global consequences of their decision. It's just it's just the nature of humanity. So how do we make that simple? I don't know that I've cracked that nut. Yeah. But, it, but I'm I'm aware of it. I'm aware of the fact that we have all of these pieces at play and that, yeah, they can grow a lot more timber in the Southeast than they do here on a shorter time frame. But most of it does not end up in solid wood products. It mostly ends up in pulp or other kinds of materials. Now, if we crack the nut, if the engineering world cracks the nut on being able to use really small diameter stuff for these massive buildings, well, that would that would be a total game changer. Total game changer in so many ways. Um, I don't know where they are with that. I mean, yeah. I've talked... Uh, who was it? I'm going to say this was at least 15 years ago. I met with uh, a, an architect named Michael Green, who was a Canadian guy who had done some of the first mass timber buildings up there. And he was talking about how when they did the design, you know, you have a big solid square beam, right? You didn't need all the wood in the middle because all the stresses were out here on the sides. And so we really needed to either cut the board differently or maybe use like plasticized wood or something. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I, I've even heard a couple manufacturers that, you know, say that some of their LVL or, you know, which laminated veneer lumber lumber. Um, thank you. Um, you know, that they can produce those that uh, exceed the, holding capacity or the weight bearing capacity of comparable size steel beams um with wood and oftentimes uh you know lighter than that steel beam so you know the the technology and what we can make out of wood to me i think we've only scratched the surface we've we've done the easy stuff now it's time for the scientists and the engineers to come up with the hard stuff but 
with that, that still means though that we got to cut trees and we get still got to have lots of landowners who are dedicated to growing them. Yeah, and I mean, if you don't have the landowners dedicated to growing them, then it's still a one way flow, just like it is pumping oil and gas out of the atmosphere, you know, or digging stuff out of the soil. I mean, the beauty of trees or forestry is that it's it can be regenerative. Number one, it's regenerative. It's renewable. Most of the other materials that we use are non-renewable. So when we think about cyclical circular economy, we did some work. 2020, January 2020, we had a meeting on circular economy in wood. Fascinating. We had, I don't know, 50 or 60 people from across the country and including some from Canada. We even had a guy up from Chile uh, talking about what would it take to integrate wood into the circular economy? And I mean, the challenges are mammoth because the things in front of us are mammoth. We only, like I, I keep going back to, we only have one earth. And, you know, I sometimes make a crack about, you know, maybe Elon Musk will get somewhere else, but the rest of us, we're stuck here. <laughs> and, yep. and so let's think about how do we treat this earth as, you know, how, how do we treat her to sustain all of these systems? And I think everybody thinks the same way. We're just arguing about what's the appropriate mix, right? Right. Yep well let's keep arguing and but let's not forget that people are part of the system and that that's what i keep interjecting and that's what um has become so apparent to me when i work with small landowners is they don't view themselves as separate from the system they view themselves as a part of the system and i think if i had to identify a group that they're most aligned with in that sort of approach to land it's our it's our uh, tribal communities. They think of the, about themselves as part of the system. They don't think about themselves as separate. And like I said, we had seventy years to sort of grow people into that. So you have multi generational families that that's just the way that they think. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it. I think it's it creates a whole different mindset and perspective in how you look at the environment and approach the environment if you realize that you are part of it versus you're an outside observer um, impacting it and maybe even not even understanding what your impacts are. Um, but, well, hey, we've, we've been going for a while here and uh, I want to thank you and Obviously, if folks um, that aren't affiliated with farm forestry want to learn more, um, looks like at this, this slide, they can find uh, the website for Washington Farm Forestry. And then I assume that other states have similar programs. Yeah, uh, we're part of a four state uh, entity that puts out the Northwest Woodlands, which is a magazine for small forest landowners. So there's the... Um, Oh, no, I'm going to have to remember the acronyms. Uh, ID, MFO, Montana Forest Owners Association, Idaho Forest Owners Association, and Oregon Small Woodlands Association. Those oh. are the three. And, and I think that there are probably associations in other regions of the country, but I'm not totally uh, tapped into them. But you know, we've been around for 70 years, so we might take the cake as the oldest one, but I don't know that for certain. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, if any uh, small forest landowners who aren't members of yours or in other states stumble across this, uh, I would strongly encourage them to seek out their local association because uh, I do happen to know that you have chapters in various regions of washington and i know oregon's the same i have not not experienced any in montana but i'm guessing it's roughly the same model um and you know it's a great great place to learn and learn how to manage your land yeah indeed they have so many shortcuts that uh and then sometimes they have so many long cuts i'm like okay that's way too much work yeah <laughs> Yes, yes. So, 
Well, thank you for your time. And uh, we will hopefully uh, connect again at some point in the future. Sure, I'll talk about, I would love to come and talk about that small force land or carbon work group at some point in the future. We're getting to the place where we're haggling about recommendations amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then it would be nice to come back and say, you know, this is what our group of small force landowners. So we try to cover, you know, big guys, little guys, east, west, people that were interested, you know, had quite a focus on perhaps income uh, creation and others that just wanted to grow birds and bees. I, I have one group that's very interested in birds and bees because uh, the wife is a beekeeper. And then a bunch of expert scientists feeding them information. And, and the, the beauty of that was that you had all these nerdy scientists feeding information, including me. And then you had people like, turn that into English, will you? <laughs> yes. Well, we will definitely plan on it and uh, hope you have a great holiday season. And uh, we will probably right after the first of the year or whenever that work group's at a place where you can talk about and share more of their work, we'll get you back on. That sounds great, Matt. Thanks so much. It's been great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.